Here is Dr. Mohamed Wasfi Labiari, a consultant pediatrician and pediatric endocrinologist at Al Jalila Children's Hospital, uh, and he will take us through uh, case scenarios in short stature. Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it is my pleasure to be here again. Thank you, Dr. Sadiq and Dr. Abdullah. Uh, now we're moving to a, a different uh, topic after the um, intense lectures we had. We move to a simple, right, um, short stature lecture. Um, that is probably um, just, uh, uh, you, whenever there is a meeting, pediatric meeting, there's always a, a short stature lecture, right? Where is the, um, where do I get there? Yeah, okay, so I'm, the outline of the lecture is, as usual, you see, scale of the problems, causes, approach, short children with some sort of stories, genetic short stature, and some more stories. Short stature is a term applied to a child whose height is two standard deviations or more below the mean for children of the sex and the chronological age corresponds to a height that is below the second point third centile. The causes of short stature are, are wide. They, there are the normal variants, namely the familiar short stature, constitutional delay, and small for dead infants who, whom they catch up. 85% of children born as a small for gestational age catch up by the age of two to three. Those who do not uh, represent a, a problem of short stature. Then we have the systemic disorders. I'm sorry, the, you cannot read the small thing, but this, as we know, you know, um, gastrointestinal problems, namely or mainly celiac disease. You can get renal disease, chronic renal disease, cancer, cystic fibrosis, severe asthma, and some neurological ones. Endocrine causes, um, interestingly, are, do not cause that much of um, um, about five to eight percent of. Uh, um, short children have, have endocrine um, etiology, mainly hypothyroidism, growth hormone deficiency. Because this puberty, you'll start tall, but you'll end short. Cushing syndrome, failure of you know um, height attainment, and the pseudo hypoparathyroidism are just examples. The genetic diseases are the main, the main, the ones that we know about, as like Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, Noonan syndrome, Shocks syndrome, Silver Russell syndrome, and many others. And of course, we have the disproportionate child discretal dysplasias. Now, the one I didn't mention that have to be added is what you call idiopathic short stature, which is not included in this classification, but we will, we will talk about it. Right, this is a, a study from um, Finland, Helsinki, looking at children, you see, with severe short stature, minus three standard deviation, and you may notice that um, idiopathic short stature and syndromic short stature are by far the most common causes. 29% uh, of boys have ISS and 24% of girls um, have ISS. Now, the practical simple referral criteria for short um, 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 children from, from the primary care, any child less than the third centile for age on the plot, even if he's, she, he or she is developing normally. Any child outgrowing, uh, any child growing out with target range for parental heights, I um, suppose I'm growing nicely at the fifth or even tenth centile, but my, my parents are tall with a mid-parental uh, mid centile of 50th centile. So I'm growing out with, then there is a problem. Any child with abnormal growth velocity, deflection, crossing centiles, obviously. So um, who needs to be investigated? The uh, upper half is the three categories we discussed, short, short for parents, growing slowly or any child with unexplained recurrent hypoglycemia, because this usually, you know, this, not, this can, can reflect or can be uh, a pituitary, hyperpituitarism. Midline defects in general, again, like uh, cleft palate, cryptorchidism, and so on, again, hyperpituitarism. Children with dysmorphic features and or learning difficulties. Dysmorphic syndromes, it's important to diagnose children with dysmorphic syndromes because of some of, of the following reasons, provides a diagnosis for short stature, allows disease-specific growth charts to be used, 
and it permits the discussion of prognosis and facilitates genetic counseling. And I can add uh, this to this and also um, provide a proper management plan. A lot of these children um, have associated problems and you need to anticipate what is the next step and give them proper follow-up. A clinical approach to the short child, um, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. Basically, uh, you, you, if, if the child is, is short, you have to do two things. You look, you look mainly for two things. The growth velocity is very important, whether he's on a proper normal growth velocity or not, and the bone age. The bone age is very useful. And the, if you have a normal growth velocity and a normal bone age, right, usually there is an intrinsic problem like genetic syndromes, like uh, familiar, uh, familiar short stature. Uh, IUGR can give you the same, some bone dysplasias. If you have normal growth velocity, right, uh, but bone age is delayed, this is most likely going to be, in the absence of, of any other problems, this is going to be the um, child with um, constitution delay for um, uh, growth and puberty. And also mild chronic diseases can cause the same namely in particular asthma can do this. But if you have subnormal growth velocity and bone age is less than the chronological age, this is the group of what, what you call attenuated growth. And these are the endocrine ones usually with a severe chronic disease and those on medication. Bone age, as we mentioned, is a very important tool for the uh, um, um, diagnosis of shorts, of diagnosis of the cause of, or, or the direction we move into uh, um, investigating or managing short stature. Um, now we have the, uh, what we call the GP Atlas, which is based on, you know, um, just uh, artificial intelligence, and it, it looks at every single bone, as you see. Every single bone is counted, contrary to the old style of uh, Tanner White House, Grilish and Pile, where actually you need a very experienced reader, and, and there is uh, quite a lot of inter-observational variation. So it's, uh, you, get, you get from one hospital 10 years, other hospitals can give you nine years. Sometimes they tell you, or oh, the bone age is between 10 and 12 years, which means nothing really. So this this new, uh, not very new, but this is the one we are using in Al Jalila, and it is very useful. Now the baseline investigations again, that's the usual. You know, you look for the any chronic diseases or looking for thyroid, endocrine, thyroid, and the IGA, IG, um, the growth hormone axis, IGF1, IGF PP3. IGF1 is affected by by nutrition. So if there is malnutrition, you might get an, a low IGF-1. IGF-BP3 is not. So if, if both are low, then you are into an endocrine issue. If IGF-1 is low, IGF-BP3 is normal, you're probably not. Uh, the bone age, as we mentioned, and discrete survey uh, in disproportionate children. And of course, microarraying girls looking for Turner syndrome, which has an incidence of about one in 2,500. You may notice that the genetic testing play a very small role in the current standard evaluation performed by pediatric endocrinologists and has, has been so for a long time. Now, let's move to some short children with short stories. Well, this will be um, very quick. Well, a short child, 11 years, nine months, mother 157, father 172. You can see that the mid-parental centile by blue arrow is around the 25th centile. Clinical examination is prepubertal. Work up is normal. The, one, the work up we mentioned earlier, all is normal. Bone age is delayed, and you can see from the uh, yellow dots of his height that he is maintaining a normal growth velocity, albeit a, you know, a, a small one, but it is normal growth velocity. I mean, a small centile. We have one more question to ask, and this question is, yeah, family history of delayed puberty. Do they have family history of delayed puberty? If they have family history of delayed puberty, they are most likely to be constitutional short stature with a delayed puberty. And these are called the late bloomers, and the best thing is to leave them alone. Don't go any further, but you have to have um, the guts to do this without going into further testing. And uh, we get children, right, uh, um, actually on growth hormone. Uh, we, we, we don't know why, uh, and they are subjected to MRIs and, and growth hormone provocation tests and, and so on. So the next one, uh, this child or children like this, you can see that they just develop late, 14, sometimes go up to 14, even 15 years, but then they end with 
the normal um, adult height for their parents. You may, you may help them with inducing puberty if there is a problem with, with, you know, especially at school, if they are worried about their height and they're getting bullied or teased, so they can give them a little push by, by some uh, um, testosterone injections just to start the puberty, a few injections, and then all goes well. Right, another child, normal clinical examination. Father 160, mother 150. What's the next step? Bone age, okay. A bone age equals a chronological age. And look at the mid-parental height. It's under the third centile. So the diagnosis is familiar short stature. What are we going to do with the children? We can talk about this at the, at the end. Another short boy, 11 years, progressive decline in growth velocity. Bone age is eight years. This is attenuated growth, so we have a problem here. A clue in the chart to now differential diagnosis is by the arrow, which is, you know, the fact that his weight is creeping up, well, his weight is up and his um, um, height is down. Suggest three more tests to help with the diagnosis. IGF-1, IGF-BP3, and uh, thyroid function tests. These are the most likely. This is an interesting, um, well, sorry, we're just, yeah, growth hormone insufficiency is the most, this, this boy has actually growth hormone insufficiency. Most common endocrine abnormality presenting with short stature. It's instance is about 300, 300, 500 to 4,000. Can have very different presentation. A number of conditions can cause acquired CHD, especially like following um, um, brain tumor, brain tumors, for example, or injury trauma. It's a clinical diagnosis supported by bone age, IGF-1, IGF-BP3, growth hormone provocation tests, namely, I mean, ITT insulin tolerance test was the most popular, most common back in the 80s and 70s, 80s, 90s. Now it is almost not done because of the danger of complications, and there have been reports of even death, right, using it. Arginine test is, is very popular now, and, and the clonidine is also used. The MRI of the pituitary and hypothalamus is also very useful. Um, to address the issue of um, growth hormone provocation tests, now the, the new, right, um, <clears throat> mesomorilene, right, acetate is, is a, an active agonist for growth hormone secretagogue, right? And it's approved by FDA and the European Medicine Agency in 2017 for the diagnosis of adult growth hormone deficiency, right? Actually, it has less side effects. It doesn't induce the hypoglycemias in, in that you, you, you encounter in other uh, um, provocation tests, and uh, you can get the peak levels about 15 to 60. You know, the, the typical uh, provocation takes, takes about three hours, two and a half to three hours. It has less side effects which is, the dysgeusia is the most um, common, which is just altering taste, and it is uh, um, transient. MRI of the pituitary and the hypothalamus, of course, is very useful, and it should be done only when you are confirming the diagnosis, just to make sure to find the cause, to, to help, you know, um, see exactly where you stand. And, uh, and it's also important in, in midline defects, hypoglycemia, dysmorphic features, or a typical gestalt of gross hormone deficiency. Now, we move to another one, and this is, an, an, this is a true uh, patient from our um, hospital. A six-year-old girl, height and weight less than the 0.4 percentile, normal birth weight, normal development. What you cannot see much is the thyroid function test, which showed a TSH of 699. <clears throat> and a diagnosis of hypothyroidism was made, and she was started on treatment, on thyroxine. If you can see that the, the the way the, she's going, she actually went up like this, and then she's just like slightly declining. The, 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 the way she was, and, and the, the, the bone age, I did the bone age, and it was minus 5.6 standard deviation. It was very, very uh, um, low, the bone age. Was like, uh, she was six, and the bone age was about, I think, one point something. I, can, I cannot read it here. So we further investigated her for the um, pituitary, uh, for the um, growth hormone deficiency, and indeed, she is um, growth hormone deficient, right? At one stage, she had um, silver Russell gene done, though she was not 
actually born at a small for date. She didn't have evidence of prenatal growth retardation. But there was features that, after discussion, features suggestive of Russell Silver, but this came back negative. Now, we still, um, Wondering, you see, whether there is any underlying uh, the matter. So a whole exome sequence was, was sent recently. We don't have the results as yet. And you can see after the, the growth hormone uh, treatment, I think she's kind of moving up again. Too early to tell. Another example, a short girl, 10 and a half years, mid-parental height, 50th centile. Need more information? OK. Turner syndrome, okay, so these are the features of Turner, and of course, um, Turner, um, growth hormone therapy is, is, is uh, Turner syndrome is one of the indications of uh, non-growth hormone deficiency um, conditions that you receive, uh, growth, uh, um, you receive growth hormone for. It causes significant increase in body height, it lowers the MBMI, more favorable lipid metabolism, lower prevalence of hypertension. Another short boy, six-year-old, Born at term, central hypotonia, and feeding difficulty in the first year of life. Concern redevelopment, increased weight gain, height below the third centile, and this is him at birth. Huh? Yeah, we all know that now, all right. So this is a child with prader willi syndrome, and we have actually a, a diagnosis. I don't have the, uh, um, the actual genetic result, but he was, a uni uh, he was just um, um, deletion, right? Uh, and of course, the prader willi syndrome uh, growth hormone therapy is really, really useful in prader willi syndrome. With, it is good for growth and body composition, lean body mass, and bone mineral density, and it also improves respiratory function. But we have to be wary. All children with prader willi syndrome starting on growth hormone therapy must have uh, um, respiratory studies because respiratory apnea can be associated with, um, uh, with even death, right? So they get baseline and they get six monthly follow up. Right, another girl, a short disproportionate girl, a girl without cartilage formation. So she is a chondroplasia. At 27 weeks gestation, the females were noticed to be shorter. At 30 weeks, mother developed polyhydramnios. She was born by uh, normal vagina delivery at 38 weeks with a birth weight of 2.9. And chondroplasia was suspected clinically and subsequently confirmed. And the, the only... Um, Abnormality known for to cause the chondroplasia is the fibroblast growth factor receptor 3, right, mutation in the FGFR3. And this is her growth chart, which is, for the, which is a growth chart for um, a chondroplasia. It's just under the um, 50th centile, as we can see in the three parameters. Now, the good news is that there is a new medication, the vosoritide or the voxzogu, this is the new medication for the treatment of uh, achondroplasia, uh, um, and it's now available in the United Arab Emirates. We have four children in Al Jalila on the treatment. It's a C-peptide natriuretic. Uh, it's a C-type natriuretic peptide analog. It works by binding to a specific receptor called natriuretic peptide receptor B that reduces the growth regulation gene activity. Actually, what happens is that the mutation of of the um, uh, if, you know, the fibroblast, uh, you know, um, receptor uh, causes overactivity of it and it, 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 pre it prevents uh, um, proper bone formation. So by down-regulating this with the treatment, you get a good response. It is subcutaneous, dose is based on actual body weight. Uh, most serious side effect is decreased blood pressure. This is why small children, they are, parents are advised to give them good, you know, must drink and eat well before uh, I'm taking the, uh, the medicine. It is approved by the European Union at, uh, in, in August 2021 and the United States November 2021. Right, so we have given this picture about the, the common ones, the known ones. What about idiopathic short stature? The reality is all, the, all, the, all what we did before comes with nothing, at, with, doesn't yield any proper or positive results in our investigations. So studies have shown that the standard medical evaluation rarely leads to a diagnosis in an otherwise healthy child uh, with idiopathic short stature. Thank you. 
So what is the definition of idiopathic short stature? It is a height below 2.3 percentile in the absence of any endocrine, metabolic, or other disease that explains the short stature with normal growth hormone levels. And the, there has always been controversy regarding the diagnosis of short stature. Um, the usual diagnosis is that it, it encompasses familiar short stature, constitutional delay with, uh, of growth and puberty, and the idiopathic ones. Right? I think people are trying to move, move away a bit from including at least the constitutional short stature there, and, and, and because really this, this is something we know, it's a normal variant, and it, it doesn't, it's not a disease, and it ends right, with the normal final height. So, this is just a repeat, I think, of what I said, still unknown, yeah. The, the, the point is, it, there is the, the conventional diagnostic workup does not yield, as I said, and there is largely unknown genetic variants included in short stature, and the more we know about uh, um, genetic and genetic testing, the more we get to, to, see, uh, um, to, to, to see results or to see etiologies for this group. The human genome mapping of all the genes, this is 2000 and, um, I can't remember now, 2003, I think, Bill Clinton and... Um, Tony Blair, it's seven countries actually worked on it, and mapping of all the genes of the human genome from both a physical and functional standpoint what was done, understanding the genetic basis for human disease involves knowledge of both of genome sequences and of gene function. Genome data from, for, from more than a quarter million people were analyzed to identify nearly 700 genetic variants and more than 400 genome regions relating to height. So it is not, yeah, you can have a single monogenic cause for short stature, but there is what you call the polygenic inheritance or polygenic picture that, you know, you don't have much to, uh, uh, to do. So about 80% of an individual, so is, is high determined by genetics? This is a, another question. About 80% of an individual's height is determined by the DNA sequence. The fast technological development has caused a flood of novel discoveries in genetic causes of congenital disorders, including syndromic and non-syndromic short stature. Hundreds of other genes involved in rare disorders that have an extreme effect on height. The polygenic inheritance, as I said, you can have, as I mean, you can have more than one gene, number of genes all uh, um, participating in the final height, all having a very small effect, but then at the end you get a child who is short. So, genetic testing... Five uh, minutes, Dr. Mohammed. Sorry? Five minutes. Five minutes, thank you. So, karyotype is largely obsolete. Nobody's using it now except, you know, it was detects gross, gross chromosomal abnormalities. Replaced by microarray for diagnosis of, of big, of, of yeah, any major um, chromosomal abnormalities. The SNP array, the NGS, exome-based multiple gene panel, and this is mainly used for skeletal dysplasia. The methylation analysis, Russell Simfer, and sometimes in Brother Willie. The whole exome sequences, uh, sequencing, and this is like to become the first, first line of investigations for severe or syndromic short stature. It's positive in around 35%. And then the whole genome sequencing. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to this any further, of course. Now, there is uh, what we call for, for the, we developed, not we, I mean, it is, the, the short stature panel is a test, it's a genetic test that it's a form of whole exome sequence, sequencing, and it tests 153 different genes, all known to cause um, uh, problems, and um, including shock syndrome, for example, right? And we are lucky to have this test in our um, hospital. By the way, our genomics. Uh, a department just won the Hamdan Award for Outstanding Clinical Department for 2022 in, in the United Arab Emirates, and it provides us with invaluable information and the results. Right, so when do we do the short stature panel? It's a useful tool to perform a differential diagnosis of idiopathic short stature and associated disorders and dismiss possible syndromes. So here we are. Now, I don't expect you, I'm sorry, this is just, uh, if you want to take the, the source, this is an excellent uh, um, just algorithm, which is, I don't expect you to read at all. Basically, it starts by 
re reaching to where is the child, does the child have idiopathic short stature? It goes through everything, right? If you have endocrine abnormality, no. If you have if you are IUGR, no, 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 till you reach idiopathic short stature and then consider the um, whole exome sequences. Now let's have more stories to, to not many, but some interesting stories from the you know, the, the genetic um, short stature panel. Short girl, a rather short family. Born, borderline small for gestational age, has always been short. Everything is negative. And then we got the, um, the, the, the result of the, of, the, of the panel is inconclusive. And we, we don't know what it is. The, the no, no answer, you know, nothing is, is clear. And the question is, do we start this girl in growth hormone or not? Okay, we can, we can discuss this because it falls into the category of idiopathic short stature. We can hide behind the borderline small for gestation age, for example, but this is a question for um, some thoughts, right? The, so you said yes, so is idiopathic short stature uh, an approved uh, um, condition for growth hormone therapy? Yes, by the FDA, but not by the European agency. Right? So in America you can, and it has been given for so many years, for quite many years now. Um, another child, short stature, not short parents, as we see. And eventual pregnancy, normal delivery, birth weight 3.5 kilograms, height far below 0.4 percentile, and far below target range for midparental height. Weight on the third percentile. Again, this is another idiopathic short stature. What about the bone age? The bone age, as you see at the green, right, is just, just very, very mildly delayed. So what are we going to do? So let's do the test. So we did the test, and we found something totally irrelevant. The child has cytosterolemia, which is an autosomal recessive genetic condition caused by mutations in the ABCG5 or ABCG8. It's clinically characterized by the thomas. Blood work shows high cholesterol thrombocytopenia, and high plant steroids. This is actually the, the test that you do in, in, if you don't have the genetic test. You look for the cytosterol and campisterol and stigmasterol. So now, what are the, um, what is the link between cytosterolemia and this picture? We don't know yet. We are looking for it. But here is one of the yields of the short stats. Okay, the last one is short child and tall parents. Presented at nine years of age with short stature, dysmorphic features, and developmental delay. All right, so it's not typically the definition. It's got some dysmorphic features. And again, look at the parents above the 50th centile, and look at the child, and look at the bone age. The bone age is quite delayed, right? So here we are. So we did the test, and it came out with Nuna like syndrome with loose anagen hair also known as Mazanati syndrome, which is, and I said, an unlike syndrome. This is how they look. So this is just to tell you how valuable and how, you know, uh, um, important now is all this group of children, you see, to go for um, um, genetic testing and, and this valuable short stature panel. Right, growth, we go to back to growth hormone treatment in children with ISS. It's controversial, FDA approved, but not European Union. Usually children with minus 2.2 standard deviation score with predicted alt alt height less than 160 centimeters in males, 144 in females. Optimal dose not yet established, but it's quite higher than the growth hormone deficient children. Now we have to think about the cost. The, for one centimeter, usually spent about $10,000, you know, to get, to get more one centimeter extra. Wide variability in outcomes. And we have, um, this, these are studies, I'm sorry you cannot see that, but these are studies from meta-analysis from different studies in America and, and elsewhere where countries adopted this um, approach. 46 centimeters after five to three years, there is one at 219 saying no to another, but this was not a meta-analysis, just a, 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 a prospective observational study. Eight centimeters after 4.5 years of treatment and 10 centimeters after 6.5 years. Right, so we come to the summary. Uh, ISS is a very common cause of severe short stature. 
Endocrine causes are rare causes of short stature. Indications of growth hormone therapy have expanded and involved in tre treating non-growth hormone deficient children. Uh, advances in genomic technologies are revo revolutionizing the diagnostic approach to short stature. Endocrinologists must become facile with the use of genetic testing in order to identify the various monogenic disorders. Right? I'm sorry, there's actually one a very important slide that I don't know it didn't come, which was talking about the long-acting growth hormone preparations. I don't know where did it go. I can't, yeah. uh, uh, we have now, we have in, in the United Arab Emirates, we have um, the Engenla, right, or the Somagrun, which is a weekly um, um, growth hormone preparation done by Pfizer. There is one coming, Sorogoya, on the way uh, from uh, Novo, and uh, there's a third one that is, the company is not operating here, that is also um, uh, available, you see, in the United States. So the novel approaches to short stature therapy is the long-acting growth hormone preparations and the natriuretic peptide analogs of ozoritide. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, can I invite the speakers, please, to the stage? Dr. Basha and Dr. Popo. Yeah. So now the session is open for questions, please. I think we have microphones at the... Uh, Any questions? Uh, Doctor, yeah, Dr. Mohammed. Yeah, uh, I have a question for Dr. Wasfi. Uh, I came across a paper published 11 days ago in JAMA about pregnant lady who drink coffee, 200 gram, and they find that they have the children, they will have uh, short stature. I mean, I don't know the explanation. Uh, why I'm asking this? In JAMA. JAMA. GR, is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, about pregnant lady who drink coffee during pregnancy, around 200 milligram, which is the usual, and they found that they have they, their children, their uh, I mean babies can have or incidents they can have low uh, structure. So do you have? Oh, you mean you can have low growth hormone? Yeah, no, no, not growth. They found that they have they are shorter. They are Why short. I'm asking this? Because from cardiology point of view, I am other cardiology. I all the time advise my patient to drink coffee because there is in the European Society of Cardiology, two months ago, they found that coffee, two to four cup per day, reduce mortality, reduce arrhythmia, reduce atrial fibrillation, oh. and the decaffeinated coffee is not good. The caffeinated is good. So- Is that an advertisement? Should I yeah. Think an so advertisement? everybody have to drink coffee, but my question for you is why? <laughs> well, the answer to your question, honestly, is I don't know. I don't know, I haven't come across, you know, this study, I would love to read it and get back to you. I, I don't know the answer, I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, my question is uh, to Dr. Basha, you know, it's amazing that when I saw uh, the, uh, that there is about 6,000 heart transplant a year, but the need is so massive for this patient. Do you think it, we will come to an, a time where we have artificial heart, where people will walk with their artificial heart and their battery in their back or something like that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, the need is huge and the organs are few. So that's a, there's a huge, enormous mismatch between the need, uh, children in, uh, who need a heart transplant and heart failure and, and what's available. And so there's a race going on right now between the mechanical arm, creating mechanical hearts, artificial hearts, and especially small ones that you can use in, ch in small children, which, which has uh, its own benefits, but also its own set of problems. And the other arm is the biological xenotransplantation that, I, that I've mentioned both. Xenotransplantation right now has really received a big boost from the recent first human a transplant that was done from a genetically modified pig. So uh, my money would be on the xenotransplantation versus the mechanical heart, but there's a lot of work going on in both. The ventricular assist devices we're using now, I mean, we've done a two-day-old ventricular assist device placement in a two-day-old. Uh, so you can now use them in very small babies, but uh, it, neither one of the two approaches, I would say, are mature yet.
question for Dr. Wasfi. Uh, I'm conducting some data analysis about the growth charts and utilization in general pediatric. Um, you can I'll just show you my. Oh, okay. I'm just uh, conducting some data analysis for the growth chart utilization in general pediatrics. So I have four questions, just yes and no answer from you. Okay, so the growth chart is underutilized in the general pediatric clinics in UAE. The growth chart is underutilized, yes. Okay. The second one, um, growth chart plotting in general pediatric in UAE is not accurate. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Plotting uh, on gross chart. Gross chart plotting. Plotting is not accurate. Entirely agree. It's not plotting. It is actually measuring. Measurement. Across different, you know, like, you know, you rely on primary health care centers or uh, private hospitals uh, to, to get the data. Even, I mean, we, we have problems in, in endocrine centers we have. We do have problems. And sometimes you have to um, go out and measure your, the child yourself. It depends on what kind of a stadiometer, what kind of training. And remember, in, in, in big centers, they have what they call the oxologist. There is, there is a job called the oxologist. And these people are very well trained, not only in measuring heights. They, it goes far beyond that. And, and they provide a much better uh, uh, okay. way. So um, the inaccuracy on the gross chart bloating leads to under or over diagnosis of the abnormal growth. Sorry. The inaccuracy. Huh? The, yes, there is, of course, because this, there is a famous uh, um, slide where you show I measured the child wrongly on the fifth centile, but the child was on the, let's say, 15th centile. And then after three months or six months, um, I came and I measured the child wrongly again, but you put it right, and the, there's a scrippery. Sometimes people are missed, children are missed, sometimes children are referred with no reason. Just okay. because of the wrong um, plotting. The last one. The threshold for referral to the in pediatric endocrinology for short stature should start to reduce or increase. Referrals to endocrinology should go yes. down or go the up? the thresholds. Because some of the general pediatrics... Yes. Why? Uh, the threshold. The so first, the, the, well, some think, of the general pediatrics, I think we, they we will put, identify yeah. and go through a lot of investigations and maybe one, two years later they will refer. So do you well, think if, no, Well, a good general pediatrician will be very able to diagnose constitution short stature, will be able to diagnose um, familial um, short stature, whether to re refer or not after that, it's up to them. But for any other d pictures, I think referral is warranted. Okay, thank you so much. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Just, uh, just a comment to Emil. I enjoyed your presentation, Emil. Uh, I just want to mention the, uh, for, you know, he's dead now, but his contributions in heart transplant, he did the first xenotransplant in humans, Lynn Bailey in the 80s, a baboon heart in a baby. You know, obviously the baby did not survive long, but he was the first one to do that step before the University of Maryland. That's exactly right. Um, it, was, it was a baboon to an infant, not genetically modified. Maybe this is, is obviously the big difference, yeah. Very nice presentation. Sorry. Um, unfortunately, in Egypt, we haven't the program of heart transplantation till now. Uh, and we have a lot of patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. Is it wise to put on assisted device, and for how long? Yeah, so this, uh, well, this is why I think the, eventually for a region like the Middle East, the xenotransplantation, I mean, if you think futuristically, at some point there will be factories, labs, I should say not factories, la laboratories creating these animals and available in sites. And so you can basically have an organ for a child. But that's 10, 20 years down the line. But it will come. So in the meantime, what, you know, Japan is a similar area with 200 million people where there's no donation, organ donation for cultural reasons and religious reasons. What they do is they put ventricular assist devices, which is what you're mentioning, in children. 
and stabilize them like that, and then electively send them out for transplantation. That's a very different situation than rushing and having a child in the ICU on inotropes and asking where, which center can take the child. Now, for a, for a place like Egypt, obviously, who's going to pay for it? That's a whole other question. So, you know, the, the answer to your question about would Egypt benefit from ventricular assist device placement in children, the, the answer would be no, because what's the end game here? Well, you put a ventricular assist device, it's really a temporizing measure. It could be a year or two or three, but still, what is happening at the end of this? And maintenance and cost. Um, so I would say at this point, unfortunately, it's, it's a no. Yes, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Popel. Uh, I, I, when I was at Trini years, years ago, right, I had a child who came from Ireland on the boat and he started vomiting. And uh, he came to ER in, in, in Glasgow, in Scotland. I examined him and I felt that he has like a wide based gait and a bit of cerebellar. I was quite junior then. So I found my SR. And uh, he said, we'll see him tomorrow. I'll see him tomorrow morning in the clinic. And then I moved to endocrinology. And four years later, this lady came and she was really kind of looking at me. And uh, I said, oh, hi. And she said, you don't remember me. Four years ago, you delayed my son's intervention. The, my son was seen the following morning. And he was, in great, oh, he was, was flown to Great Ormond Street and was operated on, at the same, on the same night. <laughs> and he came, of course, with all the uh, late effects, endocrine effects. So my question, and then there was a paper I read years ago that the first round uh, diagnosis of brain tumors in children, the yield is 15%. This was in the 90s, all right? What is your advice to places where there is no um, integrated neurosurgery? to the primary care to the... Um, I think my advice would be to push hard. I think if you have a, a parent that's um, very concerned about their child, if you have any cons intuition that there could be something going on in the head, then just push hard for an early scan and push hard for early referral. Even if it's not integrated, you just go for wherever you can. I think um, in the primary care um, clinicians, we, we get referrals from primary care physicians in, in Doha, which some of them are not terribly specific, but we like to see them very quickly, just in case. And it doesn't matter whether we, we miss, um, you know, not that we miss um, uh, seeing them very, uh, seeing, seeing some, if, it doesn't matter if we see too many patients we'd rather pick up the occasional one with a tumor. So that's the message, is, is just push hard. I, there's nothing else you can do, I'm afraid. Yeah. Thank you very much. We're going to close the session. I think it's lunchtime now. Dr. Wasfi. Dr. Dr. Babel. And Dr. Basha, we give him the love of coffee so he doesn't need to waste his time and go and find coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you.